So welcome to our workshop on integrated backup system for man management of low back pain. Backup is a Horizon 2020 project, which is going on for approximately three years now. And one of the two, one of the ideas behind the project is to develop the platform with a software tool for patients, clinicians, and researchers to improve the management of non-specific neck and low back pain. The project is coordinated by Helios de Rosario Martinez, who will be one of the speakers today. He is at the Institute of Biomechanics at the University Politecnica de Valencia. So today we'll have um, three presentations and two short introductory talks. The first one is what I'm talking in a moment. The second one will be Professor Dragan Primoras, who is the head of the board of the St. Catherine's Hospitals, who is one of the co-organizers of this workshop. They are, they are one of the best or probably the best orthopedic hospital in the region. And they're really interested in what we are developing in the BECA project. Then we have the presentation by Helios about the um, uh, backup system for management of low back pain, followed by the Professor Mark, uh, Milton Hosdavila from the um, uh, School of Medicine in Leeds, who will present the application. And then I will finish the workshop with the presentation about uh, glycan biomarkers in inflammation and how we can use them in uh, low back pain. So since we're already late, I will stop now and just ask Professor Primorac to tell us a few words about the hospital and what they're doing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Laus. Actually, I'm just looking because we are connecting uh, from two different locations. We are currently in, uh, in the Zabo Hospital, which is uh, closer to border with Slovenia, but also our colleagues from uh, Zagreb which I don't see them at this moment. Maybe Nino. Okay, okay, that's good, that's good. So I would say it's more than uh, 18. Okay, that's good, that's good. We are all together, excellent, excellent. Okay, that's good. So we are handling this properly and about 15, maybe 20 people are looking this, what we're going to discuss. And uh, I indeed appreciate Professor Laos very much because our goal, main goal, what we are applying in St. Catherine Hospital with great responsibility, is to develop completely individual as a personalized approach in the treatment of any kind of pain, including low back pain. And as you know all, we have great experience in the past analyzing more than 3,000 patients where we are trying to define what are differences between acute and chronic low back pain. Indeed, by using all this onyx approach, and that's what makes me particularly happy, we found some linkage between uh, glycans, but we also analyzed a um, uh, bunch of uh, uh, other omics, uh, I would say, important markers from proteomics, uh, genomics, epigenomics, and actinomics. Uh, at this moment, as a in hospital, we are making one progress, which is, in my opinion, the most important progress that will be happening in the medicine in the next 10 years. We define the entire diagnostic approach, plus the best treatment for patients with low back pain, but also with the patients who are having or who are suffering from osteoarthritis. At this moment, as we speak, we are doing a clinical trial in order to treat the patient with osteoarthritis, but also patients who are suffering from all that pain by application of what we call stroma vascular fraction, containing mesenchymal stem cells, including also the parasites. The results of reducing uh, inflammation are tremendous. And that's what we are witnessing every day. But I would like to underline also that I'm very much interested to learn about the model what we're going to present in order to integrate this concept on the treatment of the future or what I call the treatment with the pharmacogenomics concept. And it's very important for me that you understand that in collaboration of St. Catherine Hospital and the GANOS founded by Professor Lautz, we are going to cover the entire market of the EU by doing personalized treatments. For example, few of you may have certain mutation, which is going to kill rapidly the drug that you're going to be used in order to treat 
throw the pain. On the other hand, some of you are going to have the mutation, which is going to put you in the group or what we call poor metabolizer. So anything that I give you, any doses of the drug is not going to help you at all because your metabolism is going to be very weak. So at this moment, it's incredibly important to understand the proper diagnostics that you are doing by using MRI, X-ray, clinical examination as well. The treatment, which we are using traditional treatment, but also pharmacogenomics treatment where we are trying to do the treatment according to your needs, according to the standards, according to analysis of the different enzymes which particularly uh, uh, participate in the drug, either transport, receptors of the metabolism. And the third segment, which I would like to introduce you, as a matter of fact, we just have patients from Cyprus who has what we call black disease. So basically, it's almost completely killed this. Patient is suffering tremendously from low back pain. And we did the direct treatment of application of the mesohemal chromosome cells directly in the disc. And patient was uh, almost free of pain for three months. And right now, patient is back to the Croatia, and we are going to analyze. So I'm very, very keen to learn what is happening with the program that you are developing, with the software, with the concept. We are very much indeed interested as a clinic to go and to do partnership with you, but it's important that you understand that everything what we had in the past with the concept, you know, all size fits all, which is not anymore something which we consider serious on the medicine. We are rather switching to the concept of the personalized medicine. We are the leader in the field, I would say in Southeast Europe. And my group, group of the physicians, and as you as you see right now, we are having about 10 physicians on the different locations, including pain specialists, including orthopedic surgery, including anesthesiologists, including uh, specialists on the physical medicine rehabilitation, as well as the students in the Zagreb. We are very much interested to learn what you have to offer and please count on us. And I will be staying as long as I can so we have many patients today. And right now, Gordon, I give you floor. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you, Dragan, and thank you for joining us for this workshop. I know that you guys are all very busy. So to avoid wasting any further time, Helios, I would like to invite you to present your presentation. Can you share the screen? Here. Yes, let's uh, see. Okay, I am showing now. So I Perfect. Okay, okay. So, uh, Thank you uh, also for uh, this, uh, for organizing this uh, workshop. Um, in this presentation, uh, what I'm going to, to do is to, to introduce the, the concept, the, the workflow and the components of this platform that is being developed in, in, uh, in our project. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Locke said, uh, later on, uh, Milton Oz from the University of Leeds uh, will, go deeper into details of um, the, the, how the platforms uh, are made, how they work and, and so on. Now, first of all, let me introduce some uh, facts very briefly of the project in which uh, this development is taking place. Uh, Backup is uh, a research and innovation project uh, funded, as I already said, by the European Commission in the framework of the Horizon 2020 program. And uh, it started uh, three years ago and it's about to end in the next month. And in this period, uh, we have gathered uh, 13 partners from nine countries, including these uh, universities, small and large companies and research center. And as uh, mentioned here, uh, the objective of the, of the project is uh, to create uh, technological tools with prognostic models. This is an important point. Uh, to support the better management of patients with neck and low back pain based on uh, digital information of the patient. And uh, I will come to this point later, uh, mo the multiple dimensions of the, of the problem. Uh, this, this kind of development is uh, more commonly seen for the management of life-threatening diseases like uh, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, etc. It, it may seem um, 
odd uh, in the first sight uh, because uh, neck and low back pain may, may be not a life threatening problem, but it does threaten the quality of life of many, many people and also the sustainability of the healthcare system itself because uh, it's a, a very um, prevalent problem. Uh, it's estimated to amount for 10% of the first clinical medical contacts, uh, and uh, which is a lot and need a better management. But well, I, I told that uh, the objective has uh, something to do with uh, multiple dimensions of the, of the problem. And uh, what I'm referring to when talking about this, okay. Uh, intuition tells us that uh, if I feel back pain, it's because there is something wrong in my back. And that is how it, this has been traditionally uh, dealt with, uh, looking for physical alterations in the spine, this degeneration, pinched nerves, etc. Also, the reality is uh, much more complicated. And decades of uh, research have shown us that both the causes and the remedies of uh, neck and low back pain involve the whole psychological and social dimension of the individual and also the biological dimension. Uh, so that uh, uh, physical activity uh, it makes a lot uh, and uh, also um, psychological aspects like the, how we cope with pain, if uh, we have uh, more or less fear and uh, of pain, and what are our beliefs about uh, how pain works, and of course all the social aspects and even the biological aspects uh, that is uh, that in this project we are working focused on glycans uh, based on the research of of Genos and and previous uh, successes that they have uh, had uh, in investigating back pain from this uh, perspective. In, in our project, what we want to do is to put together all this research and help clinicians and patients to take advantage of, of all this knowledge uh, in their daily practice and uh, in self-management uh, and help researchers to take up advantage of the synergies through collaboration from professionals of all those different fields. Now, um, to comment on the big picture, what the backup is and what is uh, how it is made. Uh, the backup platform that we are developing is uh, an online tool. Uh, and this will include, first of all, a portal that is attractive uh, and useful for clinicians and, and patients. Uh, which uh, will help them make an initial stratification and make the best shared decisions with respect to match treatments and self-management according to the prognostic estimation of future pain, disability, and work outcomes uh, on the basis of, uh, of uh, current uh, scientific evidence. Um, but uh, also, uh, starting from this portal that uh, has the, the, the aim, as I said, of attracting uh, people to, to use it, uh, this tool will also facilitate the collection of uh, data from the many domains that we are aiming through patient monitoring, guidance of onward treatments in other contexts after that first contact uh, with some tools that uh, I'm going to present next. And uh, Backup will not only run the models that we have defined so far to make the predictions, but also uh, taking advantage of this data that we are uh, collecting, uh, the system will also learn from the new data to improve the predictions and uh, to improve also our knowledge of the problem. And this way, uh, one of the aims of the, of the tool is to improve the pathways for the benefit of patients, because currently uh, the, 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 the standard pathway uh, consists in going first to the first contact clinician, which uh, is the most usual case in many countries. And depending on the context, this um, first contact may be a general practitioner, maybe an occupational health doctor, a physiotherapist, etc. Or maybe instead of uh, going to this first visit, the patient may, may also treat the problem by themselves, although this is often limited to self-medication like uh, analgesics uh, or something like that. And depending on the signs observed by the clinicians and their speciality, uh, they may refer the patient to other primary care specialists or to secondary or tertiary care so that uh, all in all, decisions uh, depend uh, a lot on the clinician's opinion or expertise, such that the patients uh, may not receive the right treatment or, and there is also a risk of delivering 
unnecessary treatment and in the end come back to the starting point. So this is a, a sorry, this is a stairways uh, approach, but uh, rather like a spiral stair with fluctuating uh, moves uh, and inefficient and limited uh, effectivity uh, that takes a long uh, a long time and may increase duration. Uh, and this in in turn uh, yields to poorer outcomes. So this is what we want to change with our approach. In our approach, the first contact clinician, whoever it is. Will uh, may find in in our tool um, a, a useful tool to deliver personalized, stratified care, targeting treatments depending on the key characteristics of the patient, and uh, reverting those disadvantages of uh, going in loops, and uh, so that uh, moreover decisions will not uh, diverge depending on the background and expertise of the clinician, and self management will not depend on the arbitrarity of the of the patient but everything, all decisions uh, may be guided by consistent evidence. And the data and the models uh, will help clinicians to make the decisions that lead directly to the optimal result for each patient. And iteration, so that iterations uh, will be uh, reduced uh, to the minimal or to the, the only ones that are necessary to, for patient monitoring. And moreover, uh, those iterations may be useful also to feed the system with new data and improve the predictions. And now uh, to go straight to the point, I'm going to present the, the components of the technology. Um, the, the system uh, is actually not only a single platform, but a set of platforms. Uh, and uh, uh, our colleague uh, Milton Oz later on will go deeper in technical details of this. Um, but uh, what I'm going to present is uh, an overview of these uh, components, this uh, web application for the first contact, uh, the pro professional platform and the self-management platform and so on. Um, and to start with the first, and I would say also the most remarkable tool at the moment, uh, one of the, the platforms in this set of platforms is the first contact tool uh, for clinicians that uh, has been designed by uh, the University of Kiel and developed by uh, University of Leeds within the project. This is a decision support tool designed for first contact clinicians in the very beginning, when you are trying to decide on a management plan for a patient and give them an initial care plan. And also maybe uh, signpost them, the patients uh, to, to have them to have physiotherapy or to have some painkillers or even uh, be referred off uh, for some imaging if that's really necessary. Uh, this tool integrates uh, three primary functions. One of these functions is the assistance uh, for risk stratification uh, with uh, this kind of, uh, of predictions and individualized predictions of pain and disability in the next uh, two or uh, six months. Uh, this is based on the START MSK tool that uh, was developed by uh, Kiel and that has been thoroughly uh, validated in uh, several, uh, in various clinical trials, like uh, this uh, reference uh, commented in here. And uh, it's a tool that takes the outcome of a very simple set of um, 10 questions uh, plus, uh, well, uh, plus uh, some other indicators and provides you uh, with predictions based on the similarity of thousands of patients in those randomized control trials. This is uh, one of the functionalities of the first contact uh, tool. And the other is the design of a personalized care plan based on much treatments according uh, to these uh, outcomes uh, and guidelines that have been also revised in the, in the project. In, in this uh, systematical review that is mentioned here. And uh, finally, uh, this tool will give clinicians the possibility to have uh, some uh, user statistics and compare decision-making between clinicians and other medical centers. And then uh, there is also a secondary function of uh, this first contact tool, which is to engage patients, as I said in the beginning, to participate in research and take advantage of the other tools for the management of uh, their back pain and general health. 
um, I need uh, I need to explain uh, why I'm commenting of engaging patients. Okay, the point is that uh, one of the problems of involving patients in in research uh, in the first contact is that uh, in the first visit there is no time to deal with complications uh, of uh, research studies uh, like uh, health data management, uh, informed consent, and these things that are necessary uh, to conduct uh, studies. So uh, this tool uh, will work anon anonymously. So this is something that the, the clinician can have in the desktop, and it is not necessary to include um, personal uh, data. But uh, the clinician may invite the patient uh, through uh, an email uh, where the, the patient receives their report of this uh, initial prediction and uh, invite them to, uh, to participate in the studies framed in backup or also to use the self back web app for self-management that I will comment on later and also um, pass uh, other kind of tests like the glycan age that uh, is being connected to, to backup to uh, obtain also uh, more data that, uh, as we commented in later presentations, uh, may be uh, also relevant. Uh, although uh, this is an incipient research, so what we need is this kind of data to relate uh, uh, the, the results of tests and the biomarkers uh, with phenotypes, etc. Now, that was uh, the, the first uh, tool that uh, is used to make the first uh, predictions and to engage patients in other studies and in further uh, monitoring. And uh, Backup also integrates with other platforms. This one is the Antari Home Care platform that is a, a telemedicine uh, web application designed by the technology company GMV uh, to monitor the progress of patients with chronic illness. Uh, with this tool, uh, the clinicians can introduce multiple measurements and results of tests and visualize the evolution of primary and secondary health parameters. And here, the treatments can be included as part of the activity plans of the patient who may receive this information at home and also keep track with the clinician. Um, from this portal, the clinician can also access the visual representations of the prognostic uh, models uh, generated by backup for different aspects of health and work with the data that is obtained uh, from the patient. And uh, the third uh, platform that uh, I'm going to present uh, is uh, the self-back uh, application developed in, in also uh, a sister project of backup uh, led by the Norwegian Technology Science and Technology University. Uh, this uh, tool is uh, aimed at a form of intervention that uh, deserves special uh, attention, that is self-management, which is endorsed by clinical guidelines as a core component in the management of non-specific neck and back pain. The basic ingredients of self-management are uh, activity, strength and flexibility exercises, and also uh, learning materials to, to learn about the nature of neck and back pain and to reduce fear, that is a very important point. So um, Backup will provide two self-management resources uh, and one of them, uh, besides the training materials, is the self-back decision support system, uh, which as I said, was developed in, in that uh, sister project and which is a, a mobile application that takes the patient profile obtained via a web-based uh, questionnaire uh, and then runs a case-based reasoning cycle where the data obtained from the current patient is uh, matched to previously successful patient cases using a similarity uh, measure. And uh, this information uh, is used to form a tailored self-management uh, plan which are pushed to a mobile app, uh, which is also used by the patient to collect data from, from further questionnaires on a weekly basis. And uh, with uh, this, the self-management plan is also updated uh, every week. And uh, patients uh, using backup are, as I said before, uh, invited to, to use also this tool to complement uh, the recommendations and the treatment uh, indicated uh, directly by the clinician. And finally, 
uh, there is also a platform for researchers that is uh, based on the Multics system created by the Center of Computational Imaging and Simulation Technologies in Biomedicine of, of Leeds, of University of, of Leeds here. This uh, platform uh, offers services to work with data from multiple health domains, and uh, their uh, researchers can manage and visualize data, perform analysis, create workflows, explore results, and uh, also explore simulations and collaborate sharing their data and the tools, uh, which include, as uh, I said, those uh, three ones that uh, I commented, the first contact web app, the Atari Home Care, the self -back, uh, also connect the uh, Glycan Age, and uh, some modules that uh, are still under development. Uh, there are actually currently various studies made by the partners. Uh, there are also different data sets and demonstrators, both on the, based on those results integrated in the platform and uh, some tools connected to it, as, as uh, I said. And the uh, nice uh, thing is that uh, this uh, platform um, can work at the same time uh, with uh, the, uh, the actual uh, applications that they can may be used uh, by uh, clinicians and researchers, uh, clinicians and patients, sorry. And uh, at the same time, researchers uh, can uh, can uh, make investigations uh, with uh, with the data used by these platforms that are connected here, and also develop their own studies uh, in the same in the same place. Also. Um, I, uh, this will be explained in, in more detail later on by my uh, colleague, uh, Milton. So thank you uh, for, uh, for your attention. And I give the floor again to, to Dr. Lauk. Okay. Well, thank you, Helios, very much for the presentation. And I suggest that we move directly forward to the next presentation, which will be by Professor Milton Hosdavila from the School of Medicine at University of Leeds. Milton, can you share your screen? Yeah. Hello, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I, I work uh, as a research technology officer at the University of, of Leeds with Professor Alejandro Frangi. I will present the research platform, which is the back end of the backup um, uh, platform. And I divided this presentation into sections. The first one is an introduction to Muntix, which is the, the back end, and a demo of the backup platform and the patient certification web app that Elias just mentioned. So I will start with Muntix. Uh, what is Muntix? So Muntix is a framework, is a middleware in which on top of this, we have created the backup research platform. So in, 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 the, in, the, cons, in, the, in the context of the web application, uh, Multix is the backend. We collect the data, the data from, the, from the external applications and return the predicted values to, to the different um, application. But I will come back to, the, to this in a few minutes. So what do we want to do with Multix? Uh, what we want to do is to accelerate the uptake of AI in healthcare. And we want to do this by taking advantage of growing data sources that are now available for research, an increasing number of AI methods and tools and computational technologies such as GPU, cloud computing, etc. And by reducing the complexity, the implementation times and expenditures related to deploying AI methods in research. And of course, we want to enable collaboration. What happens at the uh, university and at different research centers is that uh, researchers want to develop their methods and their algorithms. And in order to do this, they need to have to set up an environment. They will have some IT requirements, they will need some software, and of course, some data to start to work with. And what it usually happens is that, is that the time spent in developing their methods is less than actually the time spent on setting up all the logistics to set up this environment. So these are the typical problems that we want to tackle with, with Multix. Nowadays, one of the, another problem is when, when, when researchers want to scale up the problems, when they need to analyze thousands of subjects or 
terabytes of information or use GPU for several days to train a model, an AI model. And this usually happens at the university, at the, at the cluster of the university or the computational resources of the organization. But even if they solve this problem, there's another one, which is how they collaborate with externals, how they share the data with externals or enabling reproducibility or validate their methods with externals. Because usually the computational resources at the university are, are limited and these are closed environments. So in terms of infrastructure, what it happens is that these researchers work works with an, a shared infrastructure. But the problem is that they cannot collaborate with externals in this infrastructure. And this limits the, the, the capability of uh, enabling uh, research, collaborative research with other organizations. So to, what we are doing in Multix is we are uh, developing this hybrid multi-cloud on-premise uh, environment in which we can collaborate with different people around the world with the scalable computing resources. And what we, uh, what we um, deliver is a middleware that allow to do this in, in, a, in a secure way. In the last 15 years, we have been working in, uh, in different European projects at SysTip. Most of these projects were related to the uh, Virtual Physiological Human Initiative in which the main goal is to share data, share tools, and collaboratively develop methods, models um, in healthcare. And during this process, we have been gathering different requirements and these requirements has been implemented in, in, in Multix and now are implemented in the backup research platform. So scalability is one of the first problems. We want to be able to scale up our, our experiments uh, from, from very small executions to very large without modifying the code as, as possible. Flexibility is the capability to add new methods, new models and new infrastructures as soon as they are required. Reproducibility, of course, is the capability to, to, to reproduce the same experiment with the same data to validate methods, but also take into account this, the, the, the infrastructure. So the same using the same GPUs, the same CPUs, or the same RAM. And now this is possible with cloud computing. Fast prototyping is about delivering pre-configured environments with these uh, frameworks in the, in the different uh, research fields like in well for machine learning and deep learning is TensorFlow, Keras, this type of tools that usually take some time to, to, to deploy or to install. Well, we provide these pre-configured machines that uh, already has this, uh, this, um, this uh, software installed. Workflow management is, is all about uh, orchestrating the resources in the cloud, large execution in the cloud. And visualization is about being able to visualize the results, but don't, not only um, to stream, streamline the visualization, but also to, to the, with the possibility to share this visualization with, with colleagues and, 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 and experts in other fields. Well, in relation of data, there's a lot of uh, other requirements that we are implementing. Of course, we need, to, we need to enable quality control in this platform. We need to be able to manage different types of resources, structured data, non-structured data. Uh, we need to have big, uh, big data capabilities in the back end. We need to enable data federation, we need to work with a common data model with the standard vocabularies and the standard ontologies. And we need to deal with privacy, security, and also enabling data publication. This is important for research to enabling fair research. And finally, in, as this is a shared platform, uh, we need to be sure that um, we are uh, controlling in, in, a, in a very good manner, the licensing and the IP of the things that are shared in this platform, control the cost, uh, be compliant with regulations, providing very good tools for uh, collaborative tools. And another important thing is being able to interoperate with external system, like other uh, e-health platforms, like uh, system at a hospital or um, research gateways. So we need to facilitate the, um, the collection of data from different resources. And well, after all this analysis and uh, all this time working on this, we uh, finally have this uh, framework which relies in the interoperability of these six components. Data, which is related to all the different data components that can be included in the, in the system. Analyze is related to all the different tools that can be dynamically added and 
use it on demand in the system. Workflow is once you have your data and you have your tools, you can generate large pipelines of execution. With compute, uh, compute is related to all the uh, cloud computing resources or on-premise resources that can be used in the, in the same framework. Explore is about the visualization of these resources. Once you have, once you execute your workflow, you can get access directly to your resources. And collaborate is about this control aspect of uh, being able to 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 decide who access to to your resources. And uh, and we have um, a web um, front end for 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 this framework. And there is a catalog of different assets for each of these uh, components. And each catalog is composed by different cards. Each, each card has a different set of permission. And if you have permission, you will be able to launch the card and access to the specific tool or a specific data or workflow or visualization da dashboard that is available in the framework. And if you don't have permission, you will be able to request access uh, of course, this is a sharing um, environment. So if, if you are browsing the catalog and you want to request access to one of the resources, you can complete a form. The owner of the resource will um, send an agreement. And if you, you, if you accept the agreement, you will access to this resource. And all these forms and agreement can be modified um, uh, directly from the web application. We also provide um, um, detailed information about the expenditures. So, Within the project, you can manage the cost. Of course, cloud computing. Uh, in cloud computing, you pay uh, what you for what you are uh, using, and uh, we tag every resource that is being used in the platform, so we can control in this way all all the all the expenditures in in the system. Uh, well, for backup, for the specific case of what backup, what we are doing. So there are different use cases that can be applied in this platform, but what we are doing in in backup is on one side, we have a set of researchers and developers um, collaborating in generating prototypes. Then we have uh, clinicians or, or other partners that provide data or advice or clinical advice to, to produce these prototypes. And also this clinician can uh, visualize and can test the different prototypes that are produced within the platform. So this is the basic concept of using uh, multics in this uh, research platform. And in the backup platform, what we have is uh, partners that provide data, other partners that provide models and analytics, other partners that actually use the models created in the platform to, uh, to use these models in their own platforms. And we plan to, to share all these resources with a scientific community for uh, enabling more, more insights in this specific area of neck and low back pain. And of course, what we want to do is to deliver solutions that can be used in a clinical setting, which this is the, the, the main goal of, of, um, of translating products into the clinic. So yes, going back to, 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 the, to the backup platform, what we have developed is uh, um, some interfaces, web interfaces that can be used by the clinicians and in which the backend is, uh, is, is, is multix. And I will go to the, to the demo to show the type of things that we are doing. Okay, so this is, this is the front end of the, of the platform. Sorry, don't see your screen. Did you click start sharing? Uh, Sorry, you are not able to see my screen? No, we don't see your screen. You have to click one more time, start sharing after okay. you click your screen. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, now we see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, well, this is the this is the backend, the research platform. So, 
So these are the different um, sections that I mentioned. I am now in the data section. So uh, you can see here the different data components that are now included in the platform. And if you have permission to one of these, uh, you can see the data that is available. You can launch from this uh, area, different Jupyter notebooks. Jupyter notebooks allow researchers to show the different experiments that are developing in the platform. Then in the analyze area, you can see the, the tools that have been developed by the different partners. And, and if you have permission, you can just click on one of these, then configure and launch, select the type of machine in the cloud, and then launch the tool. This will actually launch a machine in the cloud. And then with a remote desktop, you will be able to access remotely and work in the specific, um, in the specific um, application that other people is, is developing. Now the machine is initializing, but in a few minutes, this will be available for, for, for to be used. Then we have the explore area. I will go to the next section. In this section, researchers can create their own visualization of the things that they are doing. For example, I will show this is one of the questionnaires that has been developed by uh, um, the group from Jonathan Hill in, in Kiel. And this provides this type of uh, prognosis different using models that have, are already integrated in the, in the platform. So using some forms, you can provide this different type of, of prognostics. And well, there's, um, there's, it, there's a collaborative environment in which you can collaborate with different people in, in the same, in the same um, community in the same project. What I will show you now is, so this is the backend. So this, this, this is uh, where researchers can incorporate different, uh, different models and different tools in their own fields. And now I will show you the front end, which is one of these tools that have been created and actually use the models that are in the, in, in the backend. And this is the uh, first contact tool. This is a certification uh, web app. I will, I am sorry, I think, okay. So as Elios commented, this is um, a, a very simple questionnaire that can be used in the first contact uh, with clinician. It has been translated in, in 10 language. So you can, you can have different versions that are being tested in different places in Europe. And basically the clinician with the patient in the, in the, in the clinical setting can use this form to ask the patient, well, the different questions which are in, in, in the field of, of, of neck and low back pain. And after that, all this, uh, this uh, data is sent back to Multix uh, to the backend. And then according to, this, um, to the different uh, replies, the, the system will, will provide these predictions for two months or six months for the specific patient. So this is how they can provide a, a, a first insight for the patients uh, about the status of the patient. And also there's another section, which are the, the match the treatment options in which the clinician can select from a, a list of tools that are available in the, in the application. And one of these tools could be, for example, the glycan age um, tool or the vocational module or tools in other, in other um, fields of research and, and then provide advice and select different, different options for the treatment of the patient. I'm, I, well, I'm not a, cl a clinical expert in this, in, this, um, in this tool, but there's a lot of things that the clinician can do. And then at the end, the, 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 the patient will receive a, a, a report with some recommendations for the treatment. And there are different tools for, for the clinicians to see the different, um, 
the, the status of the different patients and uh, have uh, have a, a track and, mo and monitoring tools to um, to check the status of the different patients. So basically, this is how we we can enabling um, the uh, any specific tool um, that um, uh, that that is is the outcome of, of of this project. So I think this is. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. So if you have any question, please let me know and I will give the, the Gordon. So thank you, Milton. So as a final part of this workshop, I will tell you something about the glycan biomarkers. How can, can we use them to track inflammation? And why is this important for the back and neck pain? So, as we all know, patient certification is the holy grail of personalized medicine because we are all different. But modern medicine is still this not using this uh, knowledge because we are lacking the biomarkers which would stratify patients according to exact molecular mechanism of a specific disease. So eventually we have a kind of a disease name and then people with the same disease name get the same therapy, which actually works only in maybe 20% of patients. Well, 80% of them do not benefit from a therapy. Then there is a change of therapy and then an additional 20% benefit. And in a few rounds, we find the drugs which work for a given patient. The, the modern approach would be to use a panel of biomarkers stratify the patients before we give them a treatment and then immediately start with the treatment which actually helps everybody in that subgroup. So this is the idea of personalized medicine and the development of biomarkers which would enable them. And big hope was put into genetics. In the last several decades, thousands of people were analyzing genes to develop biomarkers. But despite technical success, because now we can easily analyze all genes, all polymorphisms in a given person, genetic research did not fulfill expectations because there is very little translation of genetic research into clinical use. And one of the main reasons for that is that genes do not define everything. Yes, many things are written in our genes, but still the majority of our health and disease decisions are not actually in genes, but in our lifestyle and environment. And maybe only 30% of complex diseases are genetic, 20% of longevity is genetic, everything else is environmental, big part epigenetic. And I think the best examples are identical twins. And here we see two pairs of identical twins, which clearly have a very different life trajectories. And one important aspect which has been overlooked in the past decades are glycans. And glycans are important structural component of nearly all proteins. So if we look at these two proteins, gray is a polypeptide, everything which is colored is a glycan. So glycans are just part of the structure and they perform part of the function. And this became very prominent in this COVID pandemics when initially people were looking at the spike glycoprotein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as only a polypeptide part. And this looks like this. And actually, when you add glycans, the real, the functional molecule looks like this. And you cannot understand the function of this protein or this protein of this protein if you ignore the glycans. So analogy I like to make is if you look at the protein without its glycans, it's like studying this poor bird who does not have a single feather. So you can do a lot of research on this bird. You can study physiology. You can study this bird walking. You can study this bird eating. But you will never see this bird flying because a bird without the feathers cannot fly. In the same way, protein without its glycans cannot perform normal functions. And it's not only me claiming that. There are a number of strong policy documents, both in Europe and US, claiming that glycans are directly involved in the pathophysiology of every major disease and that we need additional knowledge from glycoscience to realize the goals of personalized medicine. And the reason why people were not doing that 
is that glycan analysis is very complicated. Glycans are complex nonlinear structures. You have to do many chemical steps to be able to quantify them. And this is particularly difficult in a high throughput manner. So there are only a few labs in the world which can do high throughput glycons. And actually NIH established a dedicated common fund, fund program to develop this type of analytics in the US. And my lab is currently global leader in this field. We already analyzed 150,000 different people, but not any people, but some of the best genotype and phenotype cohorts from some of the best research institutions in the world. So we practically already finished the initial fishing expedition. So the accumulation, the huge amount of data, these spreadsheets, which are the fish we collected in this initial fishing expedition. And now we are trying to mine the gold out of this big data set. And this gold mining is getting better and better because we are discovering important links between glycans and different clinical aspects. And actually nowadays, addition of a high quality glycan data is actually helping our clinical colleagues to publish their papers in leading journals like gastroenterology, circulation, circulation research, and so on. So important aspect of glycosylation is that glycoprotein is a biological structure or a chemical structure, a molecule which does a given work, but it is not encoded with a single gene like its polypeptide part, but it's encoded in a network of genes as a complex trait. So this gives another layer of complexity to biology because instead of waiting for mutations to happen to change biological structure here by perturbance in this excessive network of, of uh, dozens or maybe even hundred genes in some cases, you can change a chemical structure and then inherit it as a complex trait, which makes things much faster evolutionary. And we have to think about changing a glycosylation in a way that actually change a biological structure, change a performance. And this is something we have demonstrated very clearly by analyzing the, the cohort, the collaborative cross cohort of mice, where Grant Morahan at University of Western Australia started with a eight founder strains of mice, crossed them for three generations, and then inbred the third generation into a strains. So he practically developed hundreds of strains of, uh, he calls them cousins of these different original mice. And what we have shown is that by only three generations of mixing genetic variants, these strains became very different in the way they glycosylate their immunoglobulins. So you can actually separate individual mice from different strains only based on the composition of their IgG glycom. So these were stable heritable differences in chemical structures of immunoglobulins based on only mixing these genetic variants through eight, uh, through three, uh, three generations. So what we have, we have different chemical structures. So we can look at these alternative glycosylation, like putting a different glycan on a given site to being analogous to coding mutations. So instead of having to wait for a mutation to happen, for a gene to change, for a protein to change, here, this is happening through alternative glycosylation and adding a different glycan structures on a given site, which then performs different function. And this is all encoded in genetics, epigenetics and environment. So practically what glycans are doing, they're integrating long-term history, this is our genes, short-term history, this is epigenetics and environment, this is what is currently going on into alternative glycosylation, which then performs a specific function. And on immunoglobulins, one of the important aspects which is being regulated by alternative glycosylation is low grade chronic inflammation. So immunoglobulins have multiple roles, how they're balancing inflammation and either 
pushing the organism towards a pro-inflammatory form or suppressing inflammation and making things less inflammatory. And by analyzing so far over 150,000 people, we have shown that these glycans which change are important biomarkers in many diseases. And um, in principle, in all diseases, what we see, we see that people who develop a disease change their glycans in a way to become more pro-inflammatory. And this actually happens before the disease develops. So these um, modifications of the IgG glycan, which are instead of suppressing inflammation, starting to promote inflammation, are probably contributing to the development on a of a number of different diseases, which we have published in a number of papers. But if you look at combined, practically we see that in many different diseases, and here's approximately a dozen of them, changes go in the direction of aging. So these are the four major IgG glycan components, agalactosylated, bigalactosylated, bisecting, and salic acid. And we see that in most of the diseases, changes go in the same direction. So people who will develop disease have a more pro-inflammatory glycan. So through the backup project, which try to apply these glycan biomarkers, which quantify inflammation, to the clinical problem of back and neck pain. So what is currently known about the biomarkers in low back pain is that we have two sets of biomarkers which have been published in the past. One are the glycan, one are the genetic polymorphisms, and the other are the glycan biomarkers. And actually even by analyzing a huge cohort of over 150,000 people, there was not much of genetic information behind the, the back pain. So apparently the genetic component of a chronic back pain is not so strong. It's more obviously more environmental. And glycans seems to be more informative here. So when we did an initial study of glycans in a low back pain, and this was done through the Painomics project, we found that in a subset of patients, there are glycan signatures which indicate systemic chronic inflammation. I think here it is very important to stress that um, it is very hard to treat uh, such a complex problem as a chronic back and neck pain as a single disease. Obviously there are many different molecular or physical things which lead to these problems. And apparently in a subgroup of patients, there are changes in glycans, which are indicative of, of uh, chronic inflammatory processes, which are systematic. And this initial study was done on three clinical cohorts, one in Italy, one in Belgium, and one in Croatia. We had both uh, cases and controls at baseline and then at follow-up to see whether this acute pain then converted into the chronic pain. And what we have observed that in people who resolved the acute pain, so they had a back pain in time point one, but they did not have it anymore in time, put, time point two, these uh, glycans returned to normal, so-called normal glycans, Why, in people who still had pain, there were still changes indicative of uh, low-grade chronic inflammation. So this inflammation actually could be kind of, um, this glycan biomarkers inflammation could be indicative to distinguish between the converters and non-converters from acute to uh, chronic pain. But the problem here is that the glycans are extremely variable and inter-individual differences are blurring the differences between uh, people who would and would not converse to chronic pain. So it does seem that we have um, 
significant potential to predict chronicity, but it's only in some types of back pain, not generally. And in this initial study, there are some indications suggesting that it's actually discogenic and sacroiliac joint pain, which is somehow more linked to glycosylation than this kind of spontaneous or trauma injury related pain, which is in a way logic, logical because we do expect to have more inflammation here than in this, this type of uh, low back pain. So then what we did, we analyzed a second large cohort of over 6,000 uh, serum samples from the cohort called the Twins UK, which are twins in the United Kingdom. And this is actually the largest glycomic cohort in the history which has been analyzed. And this is unique because we had the same individuals collected in three time points over 15 years. So we could actually track the development, see what is happening with time. And what we observed is that these differences which we find in glycans in, in a twins UK cohort are actually consistent with what we found in a PENOC study. So low back pain is not a single phenotype, so it has to be stratified. But when we look into individual glycan structures, we see that some of these glycans significantly associate with inflammation, which is known from the past, and then it associates with a subgroup of people with a low back pain. For, for the neck pain, there are more extensive changes in glycum than in the back pain. So obviously, at least in this cohort, glycan changes in people with the neck pain are more consistent with uh, chronic inflammation. So more people who have actually neck pain apparently have a systemic inflammatory problem than in the, in the back pain cohort in the same, in the back pain subgroup of this cohort. So this is still work in progress. We're drafting up the publication at the moment, which should hopefully be out relatively soon. And to finish this, I would like just like to acknowledge that in addition, of course, to the backup project, which was essential for this analysis, everything what we are doing, particularly this initial part with the glycans, glycan biomarkers is funded through different projects, both European and the national ones. And thank you for your attention.